Welcome to the ESPR podcast Inside Conflict with Moritz Ehrmann. So in the coming episodes, we will be discussing about the situation uh, in Iraq, uh, where, of course, only a few years ago, uh, all the uh, world's eyes were turned uh, on this country when it was liberated uh, from the so-called Islamic State. Um, today, the situation in, in Iraq uh, remains critical, not only for its 40 million people, but also for the regional international peace and security. Uh, Iraq uh, held parliamentary elections last October that saw a major reshuffling of political forces, uh, most notably also the entrance of independents and former protesters into parliament. And in consequence, we could see a major paradigm shift in how uh, Iraq is governed with major implications for the security and stability of the country and in extension, the wider region. So a lot of interesting material uh, for discussion. And I'm very happy uh, to have with us two uh, very well-known uh, experts on Iraqi affairs. So this is uh, Mr. Uh, um, uh, Zaydun Al-Kenani, uh, an Iraq-focused Middle East analyst, uh, PhD researcher and teaching assistant uh, at Aberdeen University, and also a non-resident fellow at the Center for Iranian Studies in, in Ankara. Also here with us uh, is Mrs. Inna Rudolf, who, who is a, uh, an expert uh, on Iraq and more specifically also on its popular uh, mobilization uh, forces. She is a PhD candidate at uh, King's College in London and very importantly uh, for us, of course, uh, also a consultant uh, for the ASPR. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting us. Yeah, so let us start discussing um, maybe the most uh, uh, difficult, uh, from the most difficult uh, and complicated angle, um, and talk about um, the potential paradigm uh, shift in, in Iraqi governance. Um, so sort of um, from an unaccountable uh, coalition force uh, that we have seen uh, ruling uh, since uh, the end of the uh, regime of Saddam Hussein um, to what could become uh, a majoritarian uh, government. So um, what, in your opinion, um, might this mean for, for the future of, of how Iraq is being uh, governed? Um, uh, what does it mean in, in terms of Iraq's uh, relation, uh, relations abroad uh, to um, the likes of the United States, uh, but also the, the major regional neighbors, um, and so on and so forth. Um, Inna, would you like to start? Thank you very much. Now, um, that is a very broad question, especially against the background of the critical government formation process ongoing. Um, but from my perspective, what we are currently witnessing is not just a competition, uh, which is usual for every country after elections, over ministerial positions and resources, but also a contestation of the principles that um, get to navigate the political process and the decision making um, in Iraq. And that will have major implications, not just for regional security, but also for Iraq standing in the region. Now we have also witnessed a lot of diplomatic efforts by the previous administration by incumbent Prime Minister Mustafa al qadami to also strengthen Iraq's position and to shed this image of being a hostage of geopolitical conflicts. And um, it, it's logical that the composition of the next government uh, would have a detrimental effect on whether these efforts will come to fruition. And from my perspective, also, we, uh, we witnessed um, a gentle reshuffling of the cards, which was uh, made possible through reforms in the electoral law. We have now uh, a lot of new actors, new players that uh, gives uh, that that give a lot of analysts like us hope uh, for a change, for a reorientation from identity politics towards uh, more issue 
faith-based politics. Um, but whether they are to succeed to uh, establish uh, a, a critical voice and a critical mass within uh, the halls of power within Iraq's parliament, this remains to be decided. And of course, as everything else in Iraq is going to be subjected to a lot of negotiations and also um, deals behind um, closed curtains, unfortunately. Thanks a lot, Ina. That, uh, that covered already quite a lot of ground. Um... Uh, Zaydun, maybe a, a more, an even more specific question um, to you. Um, and coming back to this uh, first point that I, that I mentioned before about um, the shape um, or the format of uh, the Iraqi government. Um, and uh, perhaps you could uh, take us a little bit through um, um, how this was done in, in the past. Um, with the various uh, coalition governments that, that we have seen um, since uh, the American invasion. Um, what this has meant um, for how Iraq is, is governed um, in a positive and I assume also in one or the other negative uh, sense. Um, and yeah, and whether you see at the moment uh, a shift that might take us to uh, what, what would more likely be called uh, a majoritarian uh, government. Um, so where there would be a clear, clearly defined uh, uh, government coalition and also a clearly defined uh, opposition uh, existent in, in the Iraqi political spectrum and in the parliament. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz. And again, thank you for having me. Um, it's always uh, uh, this, uh, the type of question you just referred to me is, is is a favorite one. I like to always go back to the roots of the system. Um, a lot of people, of course, would disagree and like to focus on the current context. Um, the uh, the the political system in Iraq, uh, known as Al Muhasas Al Taifiyah, which is the ethno uh, sectarian uh, distribution or power sharing agreement between uh, the three main uh, communities in Iraq and. They are um, the Shia Arabs, the Sunni Arabs, and uh, the, the Kurdish community. And of course, the distribution is uh, for people who are not uh, familiar with it. Uh, it's mainly the premiership uh, for a Shia Arab, uh, a Sunni Arab for the Speaker of Parliament, and uh, a president uh, for uh, the, the Kurdish uh, confession. And then, of course, you have other uh, distribution of powers within the ministries and whom their deputies would be. Uh, from the traditional uh, political parties that are uh, presupposedly um, uh, representing those communities. So one common misunderstanding uh, that happens when we discuss about the power sharing agreement in Iraq that was established in uh, the early days of the democratization process, as they like to call it in Iraq, or the US occupation to be more uh, specific, is that uh, it is seen as if we are uh, uh, nominating or appointing representatives directly from those communities. Whereas in reality, uh, there are uh, certain political parties, uh, most of them that existed uh, before the US invasion and a lot of them that evolved uh, probably in very different uh, political movements or parties or ended up having a new uh, coalitions with the other political parties that were created pre or post uh, 2003 Iraq. Uh, in the Kurdish case, for example, it is the same uh, traditional uh, two-party system that have been ruling the Kurdish region uh, for the past uh, few decades. Uh, that is the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the uh, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. Uh, you have the Islamic Dawah Party, uh, which also existed uh, before uh, 2003 alongside the Sadrist movement led by uh, Muqtad al-Sadr uh, that have been heavy prominent uh, players uh, presupposedly representing the Shia community. Uh, whereas uh, with the Sunni confession, the dilemma happened because there was a, an unofficial uh, Sunni uh, dominance of the Ba'ath party that ruled Iraq during uh, former President uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, era and Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr's era. Um, the president uh, that uh, preceded the uh, Saddam Hussein, um, and then and 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 then what happened is that because identity politics uh, was enforced to become institutionalized in the Iraqi political system, the Sunnis found themselves uh, having to uh, present themselves as uh, the Sunni 
politicians or a Sunni political actor rather than Ba'athist uh, political actors. Uh, and, and, uh, and it was uh, firstly led by the Islamic party. Moving forward, it evolved into different coalitions that tend to fail uh, to uh, create a consensus agreement uh, with the traditional Kurdish and uh, Shia political actors in post-2003 Iraq. Uh, a lot of the exaggerated and hyper focus on identity politics in post-2003 Iraq indirectly and, dire and directly uh, created a lot of turbulences and obstacles to uh, any potential uh, uh, progress towards the democratization process, uh, unemployment rates uh, increased as the security situation intensified in the country in the early stages of the invasion and the sectarian conflict between 2008, uh, 2006 and 8, and the ISIS war that uh, mainly uh, took place between 2014 and 17, and the rise of uh, further institutionalizing and incorporating non-state actors uh, through al hashdi shabi known also in English as the Popular Mobilization Forces. As uh, Ina mentioned, the transition that we're witnessing with this current generation, uh, you know, Iraq's population is, is mostly a young population. Uh, we did gradually notice the move from, from identity uh, to issue politics, uh, mainly uh, in, in the protests in, in 2015. That was also the time where we witnessed um, and the, uh, an alliance, a cross-alliance, as we like to call it, between many leftist activists and the Iraqi Communist Party and the Sudras movement. The Sudras movement, of course, knows uh, the, 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 the popular and the grassroots influence that the Iraqi Communist Party enjoys on the ground, despite uh, the very opposite reflection in parliament or in governance in post-2003 Iraq. Uh, that was a, a, an opportunistic alliance where both sides were trying to benefit from one another. The Iraqi Communist Party, of course, knows uh, the, the Sudrist uh, uh, prominent uh, role and influence, which is argued by many to be the most influential political actor in post-2003 Iraq. However, of course, due to the very clear um, ideological differences, um, you know, we, we can't always rely on uh, interests to be uh, much more uh, beneficial and realistic than, uh, than uh, the ideological connection. Um, that's another topic. We can probably talk about the clash of ideological uh, uh, clashes, political ideological clashes in post-2003 Iraq. Um, finally, the most um, um, transition or the most event that led uh, to uh, us to witness the government finally engaging more than any other time before to uh, 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 systematic demands from people. Um, a lot of the, the, the political uh, actors or the political class or the government to try to narrow down the demands of the October protest movement that uh, took that started or began the anti-government protest that began in October 2019 as uh, a protest movement for to tackle unemployment rates or the security situation. However, those were just a few demands of an overarching demand where uh, Iraqi activists and civil society actors and young people were demanding a, a, a crucial and a systematic change of the entire regime. And the main focus was on the ethno-sectarian ethno regime, the Muhasasa system. And that Muhasasa system is uh, indirectly being defended by the traditional political parties, while at the same time, their discourse is, is, is openly more lenient towards uh, the idea of more inclusivity from uh, traditional political parties beyond the uh, uh, typical uh, Muhasasa parties since 2003. Um, uh, you can notice the, the, the Speaker of Parliament uh, refusing to acknowledge there is uh, a Sunni Shia divide in society. Um, if, and that, of course, is, is very different in comparison to the other speakers of parliament. Um, and you can finally see um, Muqtada Sadr, despite the interests or the actual agendas he has behind creating a majority government instead of a consensus government, is because he and the Sadr's movement are very aware uh, that Iraqi public opinion is heavily influenced by the political discourse presented 
by uh, the October protest movement, which uh, uh, is not uh, demanding uh, new early elections by the same ethno-sectarian quota and power sharing agreement, but it's demanding a new political system. Interesting and very comprehensive. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so, in conclusion, um, this means that uh, uh, the move towards a more majoritarian uh, and also uh, in extension um, less identity um, focused uh, mode of governance is an uh, uh, an answer in a certain way to to the protest movement that uh, of course held most of the political system uh, captive uh, for quite a while in the last in the, over the last two years um is that something is that a statement you would you would agree to uh inna i think also what what, what they don't was pointing out is um very important to understand for all of the outside um observers of uh what, what's currently happening and and that's um this muhassasa ta'ifia it's sort of a misleading concept because what we are witnessing is more of a muhassas hizbiya and, and, and like a, a partisan muhassas system. So uh, from, from my impression also, like from the protest movement, from the demands of the Tishreen, like that is uh, one of uh, the biggest like grievances which uh, the Iraqi street was protesting against. So not just like to make sure that it's about issues, that it's about good governance, that it's about really reforming the system, but like that people move away from those personality like uh, based uh, style of dividing the spoils. And, and, and that's a very important part, I think, also in, in the future negotiations when it comes to government formation to move a bit away from personality codes and to try to build strong institutions instead of building, um, let's say, further individual champions of the political process. Very, very interesting um, what is happening here in the, in the political uh, segment. I, I have yet another uh, follow-up question, um, maybe to, uh, to Zaydun, but I, saw, uh, I think uh, also Inna might have uh, a thought on this. Um, so, uh, if uh, Iraq is indeed uh, moving towards a majoritarian government, um, and in a situation where at least um, part of the opposition is quite heavily armed, um, so, in extension, represents uh, some parties uh, affiliated with uh, uh, with the popular mobilization front uh, forces. Um, what does it? What what might this mean for the stability of uh, of Iraq? If I'm going first, uh, Ina, sorry. Um, it's certainly the security aspect or the security factor uh, behind not including, um, to be more specific, uh, the coordination framework parties uh, that are trying to be a part of this uh, consensus government, which the Sudras movement is pushing for a majority one. The security factor is actually a, a warning that is being presented uh, to Muqtada Sadr by uh, his very own partners in the very same coalition that he has created with the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the sovereignty coalition between uh, uh, Azam and uh, Taqaddum. Um, there are a lot of observations and analysis and even public statements by advisors and politicians uh, that are closely connected or even officially affiliated uh, with uh, the leaders or, or, or members of that coalition that are warning about um, trying to convince Muqtada Sadr to at least accept including uh, the coordination framework under a majority government as long as it doesn't include Nuri Maliki. And here we can realize that Muqtada Sadr is uh, framing a majority government uh, in his own definition. And that is where people are trying to uh, uh, tackle uh, uh, the, the the notion that they won't buy it anymore. Basically, people are not accepting uh, the, the 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 definitions that is imposed on them or is promoted through the propaganda machines uh, affiliated with the political parties that usually do create these majority governments. Uh, so the so so the Sudras definition of a majority government 
is, is still uh, under discussion. However, one of the very certain things we are realizing in, in the meetings uh, between the Sudras movement and other political parties affiliated with Iran or even with Iranian officials is that it should exclude Nouri Maliki and coordination framework are apparently, according to him, more than happy uh, to join a majority government um, uh, as long as it doesn't include uh, uh, Nouri Maliki. However, um, both the uh, promoters or the political advocates of a consensus government and uh, the adv adv advocates of a majority government, uh, they have a lot of other gains that they are aiming for beyond the official cabinet. There are a lot of positions uh, such as director generals and a lot of positions of commissions beyond uh, the ministries that have uh, great access uh, to financial resources and, and contracts uh, of millions and sometimes billions of US dollars and uh, that would um, benefit indirectly companies or, or contractors that would be affiliated with those political parties. And uh, that's another layer of the political corruption in Iraq. So even if we are to hear about a majority or a consensus government uh, being formed in 2022, uh, we might realize that there has been uh, compromises uh, from the winning party to uh, the officially losing party uh, beyond the official cabinet formation. Thanks a lot. Um, Ina, what do you have to, to add to this? No, I absolutely agree with, with all of the arguments that um, Zedon just made. And um, I think one of the compromises that Sadr would be facing uh, with this very attractive idea of a majority government is how he's going to negotiate or to reach a settlement with all of those parties who want to keep up their patronage networks. And as Aidan was explaining, like that goes uh, far beyond ministerial positions or like who gets to represent the minister. But it's a lot about uh, attracting government uh, contracts and uh, also promoting that uh, a certain, let's say, friendly agency or contractor um, gets to win a certain government bid. Um, and he started his own campaign already uh, with, with, with the Sayerun movement. One of the main slogans was about uprooting corruption um, with no compromises. So uh, I think like this would be one of the major battles like that he has to win to preserve his credibility. And I would just like to add why this idea of having a majority um, government is also attractive to the Iraqi street. And um, I think this can be attributed to the whole frustration of always having like uh, this uh, compromise solutions. So, for example, if one cannot reach an agreement, who gets to call itself the uh, biggest parliamentary bloc? then it's very difficult to find also a prime minister that would have a force behind him and who can really implement decisions and not just issue executive orders, but make sure that all of the political parties abide by the way the law is being interpreted. And I think that's a very important point that a lot of people are also hoping that through a majority government, one would have like more weight to um, make sure that things are happening on the ground and not just like staying in the realm of, of political slogans and sort of like hijacking the language of the Tishreen and moving it to the halls of parliament. Thanks a lot, Ina. Thanks a lot, uh, Zedun. Uh, I have the feeling uh, we could uh, continue this conversation for a while. Um, there would be so many uh, other aspects, I think, that, that uh, we could discuss. Um, we will keep discussing with the two of you um, in our next segment. Um, however, um, for today, I wish you um, uh, uh, all the best and uh, and thanks very much for for being uh, here with us uh, in this in this very interesting conversation. Thank you for having us. Subscribe to our podcast or visit the website insideconflict.com. For more information about the work of the ASPR, visit aspr.ac.at Until next time.